Well, hey, what's up, everybody? Great to see you guys this weekend. My name is Witt, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here. And just want to say welcome, no matter where you're watching from, whether you're here in this room, out in our lobby, watching online, or out at our South Campus. Let's make some noise for everybody out at our South Campus. What's up? Great to have you guys this weekend. We're starting a brand new series. I'm really excited about it. One question that will change your life. That's a big promise, but I think we can live up to that. One question that will change your life. But before we jump into that question, I want to kind of take you back, back about a year ago when we did a series, my dad did a series called We Can't Stay Here. Anybody remember We Can't Stay Here? It was a great series. We talked about our core values in that series, kind of what we believe as a church. And when we talk about core values and when we put these core values together, these weren't supposed to be like mission statements for internal you know, purposes within our staff, but these were things that for all of us as a church, all of us together as a community, that we would aspire to these behaviors, these mindsets, that this would, would be kind of what we're known for, these five values. We talked about an empty seat is a serious matter. We talked about how that anything worth doing is worth doing right because we believe in excellence. We, we talked about the growing people change. We talked about we church, not me church. And those five values, if you're here at this campus, are on, on the, the wall out, out, out beside our, uh, our cafe area. But, but I want to talk about that fifth value that's in there this weekend, and, it, and it's this value here. It's saved people serve people. Saved people serve people. When we Talk about being saved in church, and when you're in church, that's one of the things that you hear a lot about. People talk a lot about being saved. Jesus saved me. In fact, some of you, you know the date. You would say, Jesus saved me on this day. I was saved this day. When we talk about being saved in church, when we talk about saved people, typically what we talk about is we talk about it only in the negative sense, not necessarily in like a, a Debbie Downer kind of negative way where we're just having like a bad impression of it or bad thoughts about it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about negative, like, like subtraction negative, like, you know, uh, two minus two equals zero, that kind of thing, like subtracting. We think of it in terms of like Jesus subtracted our sin from our lives, right? So, so when we got saved, we think of it like, you know, I used to have all this sin, I used to have all of this past, but then I was saved, and so all of that went away and I'm, I no longer have any of that anymore. So when we think about salvation, when we talk about salvation, typically we talk about it only in the negative, only the subtractive part of, of, of salvation. But salvation in the scripture is more than that. It's not just that Jesus saves you from something, that he saves you from your sin, from, from sin and death and the grave and hell and all of that, that Jesus doesn't just save you from that, but that he saves you for something. And this is a truth that runs through the whole scripture, that Jesus doesn't just to save you, or God doesn't save his people from something, but he saves them for something. That whenever he saves you, he saves you from something because he has something for you to do. And this reveals a huge truth that runs through the entirety of the scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. This truth runs all the way through scripture. That is this, that when God wants to do something for people, he almost always uses people to do it. When God wants to do something for and on behalf of people, he'll almost always use people to get the job done. When God wanted to bless the whole earth, he partnered with a guy named Abraham. In fact, you guys, uh, we talked about Abraham last week. When you read in Genesis, this is what God said to Abraham. He said, Abraham, through you, through your offspring, I'm going to bless everybody. The whole earth will be blessed, and I want to bless everybody, but to do that, I'm going to do it through you. Because why? Because when God wants to bless people, when God wants to do something for people, he almost always does it through people. When, when the Israelites were, in, in, uh, when they were in, enslaved to the Egyptians, they had been enslaved for hundreds of years, and they were, they, were, they were being mistreated, they were being taken advantage of, and they cried out. They cried out to God, and God said, I heard the cry of my people. They're being abused. They're being mistreated. The Egyptians are, are making them work in unreasonable ways. They're, 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 they're in slavery to the Egyptians. And something's got to be done about it. It's a horrible thing. What's happening to my people? And so God hears about it. And when he wants to do something about it, he doesn't appear to Pharaoh himself. He doesn't appear in a vision or in a dream and say to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, let my people go. No, 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 no. You know what God does? He goes to a guy named Moses. He says, Moses, you're going to go to Pharaoh. You're going to talk to Pharaoh. You're going to stand in front of Pharaoh and you're going to say, let my people go. Why? Because when God wants to do something for people, he almost always does it through people. 
When, 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 when the Midianites were coming through the land of Israel, and what they were doing is they were coming through with all of their animals and all of their people, they were like locusts, and they would come through, and they would wipe out the crops of the Israelites, making it so that they couldn't eat anything. These people were dying of starvation, and they're crying out to God. They want somebody to save them from the Midianites, and so what does God do? He sends an angel to appear to a man named Gideon. Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. Wine presses are down in the ground. When you thresh wheat, you're supposed to thresh wheat up high. That way the wind can come and help separate the wheat from the chaff. But Gideon is so terrified of the Midianites and what they keep doing that he's doing this in secret. He's doing it down in a wine press. And God appears to him and says, Gideon, I want to do something on behalf of my people, but I want to do it through you. Because when God wants to do something for people, he almost always does it through people. When Goliath was threatening and he was saying, hey, send somebody out that we can fight them and then when I defeat them, you will become my slaves. And he was saying this to the people of Israel. God wanted to defeat Goliath, but he didn't do it himself. He didn't strike Goliath dead with a lightning bolt. He could have. We read about that kind of thing happening in the scripture where God would send fire from heaven. Lightning would fall from heaven and it would set something on fire. He could have done that to Goliath. I mean, he has accuracy. Just boom. He could have pushed a button. Goliath falls, but he doesn't do that. Why? Because he wants to do it through people because when God does something for people, he almost always will do it through people. When Haman, who hated Jews, when he hated the, he hated the Jewish people and he wanted to wipe them out, he wanted to take them out systematically, he had a way to do it. God worked through Esther and Mordecai. Whenever, whenever God wanted to do something on behalf of all of humanity, he wanted to save all of us from our sins and take care of the whole human race and deal with the sin problem once and for all, God became a person. He became flesh and blood. He became a man, and he lived and he walked among, among us. When God wanted to do something for you, he did it by becoming one of us. He did it through a person, through a man, because when God wants to do something, people almost always, he'll do it through people. When God wanted to do something for Tulsa, Oklahoma, when he looked at our, our city and this region and he said, to himself, he must have said to himself, there's a group of people in this area and they have no shepherd. They have no community to belong to. They're, they're like sheep without a shepherd and they need to be gathered together. They need to be cared for. They need somebody to, to bring them together. They need a community and they need each other. God didn't do it himself. He spoke to a man in West Texas, called him to come here from West Texas to live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And my dad started this church 28 years ago. Why? Because when God wanted to do something in this area, he did it through people. He wants to work through people. When God wanted to do something in your life, think about your past for a second. What, what, what is there in your past? For some of you, there's some pretty dark stuff in your past, some things that happened that you're not proud of, but you look back on that and you, think, you say, thank God you saved me. You brought me out of it. But how did he do it? He used people. I guarantee you that you can think of people in your past. You can think of strategic people who came into your life. Maybe it was several people. Maybe it was five or six people. There were several people who, who said something, who did something, an act of kindness. Something happens. An invitation was made, but somebody invited you. Maybe a mother, a brother, a father, a, a, you know, a, a sister, an uncle, a pastor. But someone reached out to you. Someone invited you. Someone did something for you. God wanted to work in your life, and he did it through another person. Why? Because saved people serve people. Because when God wants to do something on behalf of people, he always, he almost always will do it using other people. And that's what this value is all about. Saved people serve people. Now, this is something that in our church we've wanted to, just even at the leadership level, we wanted to press this value down into our church because, because there are tendencies that churches have, just like there are tendencies that people have, where we drift towards certain tendencies, sometimes accidentally, things that we don't even mean to do, but we just drift towards them because it's kind of how we're wired up. You have strengths and weaknesses, and chances are that there are certain strengths that you have that are also your weakness. Your ability to get things done, your ability to push through and drive through and make things happen is a great strength of yours, but it's also a downside. It's also a negative because sometimes people feel a little bit rubbed the wrong way because you just, you, you just, you just, you're a direct person. You know how to get things done, and so in your, in your pursuit of making things happen, it rubs some people the wrong way, and so your strength also doubles as, 
as your weakness. That's often how strengths are. We have strengths, and organizations are the same way. We have strengths, and one of our strengths is that we, we, we know how to do things and do things right, and we love to do things with excellence. Excellence is just kind of like our most core value at Church on the Move. And one of the things that we've said just internally as a leadership team is that sometimes we have a tendency to be process-focused and not people focused. It's not that we don't care about people, it's just that when we get together by default because of the way we're wired up, what we ask about is we ask about how smooth did it go? How was the process? How well did it work? We wanna refine and refine and refine and make it better and make it better and make it better. And we've realized that if we're not careful, we will focus strictly on process and not on people. And of course we know that the whole reason that we're doing the process is for people. So we've tried to ask ourselves, how can we push this value? How can we push this value of saved people, served people? How can we get this down into the hearts of our core? How can we get this down into the hearts of our staff? How can we get this down into the hearts of our congregation? And the way to do that, we figured, was through a question. Because questions are powerful things. And here's sort of a principle that you just ought to know about questions. Questions, and this, this will help you in your business, help you in your family. This is an important principle, just a leadership principle. It's this, that questions reveal values. The questions you ask reveal what's most important to you. I don't know if you knew that, but the questions that you ask reveal what's most important to you far more than what you say. The questions you ask tell people a whole lot more about what you, really matters to you than the things that you say. For instance, when, when a husband comes home from work, just envision this scenario, many of us have lived this. When a husband comes home from work, you kind of see how, how men and women are wired up differently. He walks in the door, it's been a long day from work, and the wife immediately says, how was your day? Why? Because the wife is caring about connection. She cares about connecting with her husband. It's all about relationships, so that's her question. What's the husband ask? What's for dinner? <laughs> right? It's a completely different mentality. What's most important? That's the way that, it's just the way we're wired up. The questions we ask reveal what's most important. I remember, I remember this whenever I was growing up as it pertained to grades in school. Because your parents, and probably you, many of you are like this, how many times did your parents tell you, oh, what I care about in school is that you try. What I care about in school is that you gave a great effort. That's what I care about the most. But what's the question that they ask all the time? What'd you make? What was your grade? What was your grade? What was your grade? And so pretty soon, you just kind of figure out as a kid that I know they're telling me that effort matters most, but what they really care about is the letter at the top of that paper. So what do we do? As kids, we just start to figure out that the, the thing just doesn't matter if I'm learning. What matters most is that I get a good grade, right? Because we've emphasized that over and over again. And how do we emphasize it? We emphasize it through the questions that we ask. Same happens in churches. This happens in churches all the time. We don't mean to, but just by default, the natural questions are, how many people showed up and how much was in the offering? How many people showed up? How much was in the offering? How many people showed up and how much was in the offering? And so we figured that if we wanted to change that value, we're going to have to ask different questions questions. What kinds of questions are we going to ask? And so, so we got together and we said, we want to push this value down into the hearts of our team, down into the hearts of our leadership team, and into our church, and how do we do it? And so we came up with a question, and here's the question, and it's a simple question, but don't let its simplicity fool you. It is very profound. In fact, I think this question has the capacity, I really do believe this, that it has the capacity to change your life, but more importantly, I think it has the capacity to change the lives of people all around you. And here it is, simply this. What are you doing personally? What are you doing personally to impact someone's life this week? What are you doing personally to impact someone's life this week? Well, I serve. You know, I mean, I work, I, I volunteer. That's fantastic. I want to know personally because it's easy to hide behind a job. Well, I give. We, that's fantastic. This operation, this ministry can't work without your giving. Thank you so much for being generous. But many of us, we hide behind that. Well, I give. That's what I do. I serve. You know, you can serve without actually impacting anybody's life because you're, you're, you're more concerned. And sometimes we get this. I do this. We get more concerned with doing a job than we do about caring about people and impacting people. So we're asking this question. And so here's what happens. Every Tuesday when our, our leadership team gets together and we gather together and we meet, this is the first thing that we do is we ask this question. We ask the question, what did you do this week? What did you do this weekend 
to impact somebody's life? What did you do personally to impact somebody's life this weekend? Because it's easy for us, even on staff, to do ministry sometimes without even impacting or interacting with that many people because it's just process, 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 process. But in the end, it's really all about people. But you don't have to be in ministry to deal with this problem. It doesn't just affect those of us that are in full-time ministry because I think this affects everybody because people today are so busy. Aren't we so busy? I mean, this is what we do. We just, we're going from here to there, doing this and that. Do you ever find yourself on the highway in a hurry when you have nowhere to be? You're just driving fast, trying to get someplace, angry at the people. Get out of the way. Get out of the left lane. Why are you parked in the left lane? Get out of the stinking left lane. Just for the record, the left lane is the passing lane, not the fast lane, because what's fast to you isn't fast to me. So, so just, if you're not passing somebody, do me a favor and just get on over into the left lane or the right lane. Just that's public service announcement. But moving on. I gotta, I gotta play my part, and if that impacted somebody, then I did my job this weekend. <laughs> but we're in a hurry, right? I mean, I'm in a hurry all the time. It's just, I gotta get there, I gotta get there. Why? And we get busy doing our thing and living our life and living out our plans. And we live, a lot of us live just kind of head down, headphones in, not paying attention to anybody around us. I just got to do my thing. I just got to take care of my thing. Just got to take care of my plans and the people right next to me. That's it. And a lot of us are going through huge chunks of our lives, never really interacting or impacting anybody around us. We're not even aware of what's happening in their lives. We never look up. And this is a tragedy when you think about what we're called to do as the family of God. Guys, we're called to so much more than that. We can't be living like this, headphones in, just uh, caring about only our lives. We've got to start thinking about how do we impact people personally? What can we do? God, use me. And that's scary for some of us. Because for many of us, we're just, we just leave that to the professionals. Leave that to the people who are in full-time ministry. I'll just come, I'll just attend, but leave that ministry part to, to the people who, who are the professionals. But look at what the apostle Paul wrote. Paul wrote this, this is in Ephesians chapter four. If you've got a Bible or a smartphone you want to turn there, we're going to look at some verses from Ephesians chapter four. And this is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. And look at what he says. This is so huge. Look at what he says. He says this, but to each one of us, that's, that's all of us here, he's talking to the church, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Now, when we think about grace when we're reading this verse, many of us, your mind's going to go right where my mind went. It goes right to the Amazing Grace song. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And so what we think of when we think about grace is, again, we go right back to that negative thing, the subtraction thing. We think only about our past. We think only about all of our, mis our mistakes. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me grace that wipes out my past. And it does. It's so beautiful. But it's more than that. I was reading and studying this verse this week, and I came across this, this comment from the Anchor Yale Bible Commentary. I thought I would share it with you. Look at this. Look at what it says about this particular passage. It says this, that the grace, in Ephesians 4, 7 here, the grace that was given is neither a pillow for sleeping nor a comfortable, warm feeling, but a ministry. The grace that was given to you isn't just negative. There's a positive side to it. There's a ministry that goes along with it. It is a privilege implying responsibility and action. This gift is given to each one of the saints. Who's each one of the saints? Well, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, that's you. You're one of the saints. This gift was given to you. It was given to the saints, not solely to an inner circle of office holders inside the church. Here's one of the struggles, I think, that large churches have. And I'm all for large churches. In fact, I want our church to grow and grow and keep growing because I believe that that's what the kingdom is called to do, to advance and to move forward and to move forward. When a church reaches a certain size, here's what happens. I think a lot of people within the church start to feel like that somebody else has got that. Somebody else will take care of that. Whenever we think about ministry or praying for someone, praying for someone who's sick, praying for someone who's hurting, just being available to help people, we just, Leave that to the professionals. That's their job. I think it's particularly an issue in this church, primarily because one of our great strengths, 
Remember how a strength can be a weakness? Well, we have a great strength and that we have an amazing leader, an amazing senior leader. I like to think of my dad as the John Wayne of pastors. That's kind of how I think of him. He's just the guy who can handle anything. I grew up watching John Wayne movies because my dad was a Western junkie, and so I grew up watching John Wayne films, and that was the thing about John Wayne, is you always had the ultimate confidence in John Wayne, right, that he could handle just about anything that was ever thrown at him. That was the great thing about John Wayne. If you're young and you didn't grow up with John Wayne, then Liam Neeson, he's the pastor with a, a certain set of skills. That's, that's our pastor, right? And that's the kind of guy that we have. But I think one of the downsides, of, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful for my dad's leadership. I'm not saying he's done it wrong. What I'm just saying is that I think one of the downsides of that is that for so many of us, we just think, oh, you've got this. Oh, you can handle this. If the church is going to grow, it'll be you. You will be the one. It's your strategy. I'll just attend. I'll just sit. I'll just come and, and just quietly sit in my seat and receive and receive and receive and receive. Never give. I'm not just talk, even talking financially. I'm just talking just like engage. Never really get involved because you've got this, Pastor George. You can handle it. And many of us are kind of riding the coattails of somebody else's faith. I think a lot of young people wrestle with this. They grow up in a Christian household and they, they, they come up under their parents and they ride the coattails of their parents' faith, but they never really develop a faith of their own. I remember struggling with this when I was probably 22, 23 years old. It was just before I was about to get married to Heather. In fact, we were about to, I was about to ask Heather to marry me. I was thinking about it. And my dad, he played such a key role in my life, I mean, spiritually. He, he's just... I love my dad. I've always looked up to my dad. He's always been my hero, but man, just such a key spiritual role. And I remember being 22, 23 years old, and I was at home. I didn't live at home at this time, but for whatever reason, I found myself at home. My brother was there. We were in our old room, and we were just up late talking. And I was talking to Gabe about, about possibly asking Heather to marry me. And uh, I just said, man, I, I, I'm thinking about asking Heather to marry me, but I was looking for some kind of spiritual clearance. I was, I was hoping that my dad would just kind of come in and say, hey, Whit, I was praying about you and Heather, and green light, <laughs> go for it. I was waiting for that. And I know that sounds ridiculous. It's like, oh, wow, you were 23 and you were thinking that way. But I mean, that, that was the place that my dad held in my life. And so I was thinking about this. I was waiting for that. And I was telling Gabe, you know, I'm just I'm waiting for this. I'm, and Gabe just said, Whit, if God's going to speak to anybody about this, he's going to speak to you. And that was a, a revelation to me because up to that point in my life, I'd always just thought, well, he'll do that. He'll be the one to do that. And I think that's how many of us are in, in, in this church. We love this church. I, we're a part of this church. But there's so much more for this church to do. Guys, we're not done yet. This church is going to go on and on into the future, and if we want this to be a true multi-generational church, guess what? It's not going to happen because the leadership team came up with some brilliant strategy and, 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 and grew the church by leaps and bounds, and wow, we're expanding and off into the future. It's going to happen because we empowered each one of you to be the people that God called you to be, and here's why this is so crucial, and if you hear nothing else that I say, hear this. It's because God wants to do something through you that he can't do through me. God wants to do something through you that he can't do through me. I'll take it a step further. God wants to do something through you that he can't do through my dad. And for many of you, my dad is like, man, he is it for you. Hey, me too. I'm in the same boat. But God wants to do something in your life. And many of us, we've limited ourselves because we've said, that's not me. I know people who have been on missions trips in this church who found out when they went on the missions trip that they might have to pray in front of a group and were terrified to do it. Guys, it shouldn't be that way. Why is it that some of us are like, man, I just leave the spiritual stuff to somebody else. I, I mean, I love listening and I love receiving, but don't ask me to be, don't ask me to lead a small group. Don't ask me to get involved in my section. Don't ask me to engage at all because I just don't feel like I'm equipped to do it. Well, let me tell you something. God's given you gifts. He's given you situations, putting you in situations. He's given you strategic relationships where you can make an impact that the lead team of this church, the leadership of this church cannot make. 
It's going to be up to you. And I love it the way Matthew Henry said it. He said, what God's called you to do, he's graced you to do. If he's put you in the position to do it, then he's given you the grace, which is the equipment to handle it. Look at what Paul said. He says this. He said, so Christ himself gave the apostles. He gave the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. This is typically known as the five ministry gifts. These are the people who are in full-time ministry who've said, I'm, I'm going to follow God. I'm going to give up you know, my vocation. I'm going to go work in a church full-time. Not everybody's called to do this, but God did call some of us to, to take a step in this direction and to, to live our lives in this way. Pastor, teacher, evangelist, prophet, and, and, and an apostle. He's called some of us. To, to, to hold those roles. But the reason, and this is what Paul wrote, and this is so huge. Many of you have never thought about it this way before. The reason that God gave us the leadership of the church, these gifts, are you ready? Here's why he gave it. So that you could, he, we could equip his people. Why? For works of service. The reason that he gave us these gifts is to equip you. It's to empower you. It's to, it's to draw out the gifts that are on the inside of you and to put them to work. And when all of this happens, here's what happens. When this happens, all of this happens so that the body of Christ may be built up. This is how the kingdom of God expands. You want to build church on the move? We want to see it go into the future. We want to see our campuses explode, see more campuses launched throughout the city. You know how it happens? It happens through us empowering the people of our church and you getting out, taking responsibility and saying, what can I do personally to impact somebody's life? We start impacting people's lives. They start impacting people's lives. And this thing starts to explode exponentially. Exponentially. But it's not going to happen by people just sitting passively and receiving and receiving and receiving. It will only happen when we get in the game. So here's what happens. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. In other words, this is how we all get on the same team. Is we're all leveraging the gifts that God's put on the inside of us and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. In other words, you want to move from babyhood in your Christianity. You want to move into full maturity. Get in the game. Start putting the gifts that God's given you to work. When you do that, that we will be attaining to the whole measure, not just part measure. We won't just be working at half capacity, but we will be working at full capacity, the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. God's got so much more for this church to do. We haven't even started yet. We're 28 years in, and I mean, there's so much more. Just around the corner, we're so excited about this. There's so many things that God wants to do, but he wants to do it through you. That's how it's going to happen. As we move forward into the future, it's going to happen through us empowering you. So I ask you again, what are you doing personally to impact somebody's life this week? You know what this question is really about? It's a mindset question. It's a posture of the heart question. It's not a high pressure kind of thing to make you feel guilty if you don't do something incredible for Christ this week. It's just a mindset that says, okay, God, instead of just being head down, headphones in, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna lift my eyes a little bit. I'm gonna be aware. I'm gonna say, okay, what I have, what's in my hands, I give to you. I'm just, I'm, I'm just looking around. I'm available. God, I'm available. If you wanna use me, use me. And you know what? We've got some great opportunities coming up for you to be used by God. Let me just tell you about a few things that are happening. Here, just next month, in fact, 25th of October, we're launching, we're opening up a brand new venue right up here at 180. This venue, guys, is world class. If you have never been in that building, it is unbelievable. The auditorium, the classrooms, the whole thing, it's unbelievable. We're going to change our whole service schedule. So if you didn't know this, listen up. Here's what's going to happen. On the weekend of October the 25th, we'll keep our Saturday night service at 6 p.m., but on Sunday morning, we're going to 9 and 11 in this room. And then up at 180, we're going to go to 10 and noon. That's prime time, right when people love to come to church, 10 and noon. And what we've told you is that we're, we're getting ready for road construction. They're going to do some road construction out here on the road, and we want to be ready for that. And we do. That's true. But can I just tell you secretly, our secret motive is we want to grow the church through this time. We do, we're doing this because an empty seat is a serious matter, and we want to give each of you an opportunity to get in the game and to plug in and say, all right, I'm going to start impacting people. There's some empty seats. There's some opportunities. There's people in my life that I could invite to this thing. We want to see our church grow through this. How many of you believe that our church should grow through this time? How many of you are with me on this? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's fill that place up. We're not just doing it for convenience. We're doing it so that people can come. People are dying every day right here in our city. I'm not even just talking about physically. I'm talking about they're dying internally. 
They're moving further and further and further away from God. And here we sit, a group of people who would say, we have life, we have the light of God. How do we not reach out to these people? How do we not invite them? That's one thing. The other thing that's happening is this lawn up at 180 that we're opening up this weekend, we opened up last night, we'll do it again tonight, is incredible. It is absolutely amazing. We were out there last night. I mean, it's unbelievable. There's nothing like that in the city, and I mean nothing. And people, there are people in your world who wouldn't come to church with you because they're just not ready to come to church, but they will come watch a movie on that lawn. What an amazing evangelistic opportunity. There's women's uh, fitness classes that are going to be happening out there almost every morning. There's some great events that are happening out there. There's story time with moms. Ladies, incredible opportunity. Invite somebody and let them come and sit here and go, this this is a church? Seriously, this is a church? Just incredible. I mean, it's amazing that we have this opportunity. And then Christmas. This affects all of us. Christmas. We're going to do the biggest Christmas that we've ever done this year. We want to see more people come to our Christmas services than ever before. I don't know what we're going to do. We might have Jordan fly all around the room this year. I'm not sure. (laughs) But it's going to be amazing. And I'm telling you, we want to fill this place with people who are far from God. You could be used to personally impact somebody who needs Jesus. It's just a mindset. It's just changing your mindset and saying, God, all right, I'm available. I'm available. How, how, how can you use me? To kind of wrap this up, what I thought I would do is just share some stories. We've been asking this question at our all staff meetings. We gather together every Thursday and we just, we talk as a staff and one of the things that we've been doing is we've just been saying, okay guys, here's the, you know, who's got an answer to this question? Who, what did you do this week to personally impact somebody? And so people are coming up and they're sharing stories and so I just thought I would share a few stories with you of just little things. And some of these you're going to go, that's it? That's it? That's all? That's all that they did? Yeah, it's, it's not that hard. But that's what I want to show you is that it's not that hard to personally impact people for Christ. So let me just share with you a few stories. The first one is Angie. You guys know Angie. She's up here all the time. Angie Woods. And, and, and Angie, uh, uh, just this last week, she was working out at, at her uh, you know, workout facility, and she's there walking by the receptionist. She sees the receptionist regularly. She happened to notice that this girl has like some college books on her uh, on her desk there, and so she thought, maybe this girl's from out of town, maybe she just moved here, maybe she doesn't know anybody, I'm just going to go up and start talking to her. So she just goes up, starts engaging her, talking to her, asks her if she has a church, turns out she already does, she's already involved in a church big time, but she invite, but she was like, hey, that's great, just, just, wanted, to, just wanted to be available. Here's another one that she was with, uh, her husband, her and Sam were out shopping, they saw a guy in the store, got to talking to him, and we, the salesman, he was helping him. Finds out this guy loves music, so she just says, hey, our church has incredible music. And so she invited him to the church. He wasn't able to come this weekend. That's okay. Here's what she said, and I thought this was great. It's two more people than she invited the week before. For some of you, it's been months, maybe years, since you've invited somebody to church. Just a mindset. Just changing your mindset. God, I'm just available. There's somebody out there, just help me see him. Here's another one. This one's so simple, it's stupid. Marty Taylor, he's our new arts director. Marty Taylor moved here just a few months ago, and he's renting a house. You know, he's new in town, and so he's renting a house. And you know how it is with a house rental. You kind of don't take as good a care of the house you're renting as the one you own. And that's just kind of the way that it goes. And so Marty's living in this neighborhood, and he happens to notice that everybody in this neighborhood just has a great lawn. Well, Marty, because he's, you know, not owning this house because he's renting the house, he's just not mowing his lawn as often as he used to. So Marty just said, hey, if I'm going to have some kind of inroads with these people, maybe I'm just going to start mowing my lawn a little bit more. That's simple. That's not even that big of a deal. It's a silly thing, but it's just like, He's thinking about other people. I'm just going to mow my lawn. Again, it's not, it's not groundbreaking. You're not standing up preaching to a large crowd. You're just saying, look, uh, just, maybe, maybe I could mow my lawn a little bit more. That's, that's crazy. Here's another one. Andy Chrisman. You guys know Andy. Andy, our worship pastor. Andy uh, met a friend here recently. A guy lives out of state. And um, just recently, that guy called him, called Andy and said, hey, I have a friend who's in Tulsa, and he was just in a horrible accident. Andy doesn't know this friend of his friend at all. And he said, but this guy was in a horrible accident. He's literally hanging on by a thread. Doctors don't know if he's going to make it. Would you go to the hospital and pray for my friend? This guy doesn't go to our church. So Andy 
nervously, as you can imagine, and some of you think, well, because we're in ministry, that that kind of thing doesn't mean anything to us, that it's just super easy for us. On the contrary, it is totally something that many of us are not comfortable with. I mean, when you're walking into a hospital room of people that you don't know, and there's a guy laying in bed, and the only thing standing between him and death is you and your prayers and your connection to God. Are you ready to do that? I mean, how would you feel if somebody <laughs> asked you to do it? And so Andy, Andy nervously walks into, into this this hospital room, and he prays for this, this guy. He prays for healing and peace for him, and then he turns around, and the family's there, and he can see they're just, man, I mean, they're, they're understandably pretty shaken up by the whole thing, and they're, they're just in a pretty shaky place, and so Andy just says, hey, in a moment of boldness, just says, you guys mind if I just pray for you too? And so he prays for peace for their family. These people are Catholic. And so afterwards, they're just looking at Andy, and they're like, who are you? <laughs> and he tells them that he's from Church on the Move, and they're stunned that someone from a church that they've never even been to would come and pray for them and care for them. How cool is that? <laughs> Phenomenal. Here's another one. Let me tell you about Rachel. Rachel's one of our teachers at Lincoln, and, 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 and recently someone gave uh, Rachel $50, just, gave her, just wanted to bless her, said, thank you for what you do, here's $50. So Rachel felt like she was supposed to pass that gift on. She has a, uh, a friend she goes to grad school with, and uh, this friend is a single mother, she's just lost her job, and she just feels like she was supposed to pass that $50 on, but she just felt awkward about it. How am I gonna, how am I gonna bring this up? How's this gonna go down? And so just time goes by and she never gets around to giving it to her and she felt bad about it. She felt bad that she didn't follow through with what she felt like God had asked her to do. Well, even more recently, somebody comes up to her and just says, hey, I wanna bless you, gives her $100. It's almost as if God is saying, all right, Rachel, double or nothing, let's see how this works. <laughs> So she says, okay, God, I get the message. So she says, all right, I'm going to give this $100 to my friend. And so she's driving over to grad school, and she's making a deal with God. And she's saying, okay, God, I'm nervous about this. I'm nervous about how she's going to respond to this. So here's, if this is you, when I pull up in the parking lot, I want my friend to just pull up right beside me, if this is you, God. And so she pulls up in the parking lot, and guess who pulls up right beside her? Her friend. So she slips the $100 into her pocket, and she just says, okay, when the moment's right, so they're talking, they're visiting, and when the moment was right, she just said, hey, I, I just felt like I was supposed to give this to you, and I just want you to know that I care about you, and that I'm praying for you. Later on that night, her friend sent her a text and just said, you have no idea. You have no idea what that meant to me. Not just the money, but your prayers. Thank you so much. Here's another one. Let me tell you about Whitney. Whitney works out at our South Campus, and during night two of the revival, I believe it was, Whitney was, was working, and, and in the room, we were doing the invitation, asking people who, who wanted to to receive Christ, and there was somebody there, in fact, a young lady there who raised her hand. She wanted to receive Christ, and afterwards, Whitney was just kind of watching. I don't know why, but she was just watching this lady to just see if she was going to connect with somebody, if anybody was going to connect with her, and so, so whenever the service was over, she was just kind of sitting there, and she hadn't really connected with anybody, and so Whitney, just in a moment of boldness and trying to answer this question to herself says, okay, I'm going to go over and engage this girl. So she goes over and she starts talking to this girl. And here's what she finds out. She finds out that this girl moved here from San Diego, moved all the way across the country because her best friend lived here in Tulsa. So she comes here, she moves here. And uh, when she gets here, just shortly after she gets here, her best friend moves away. Thanks a lot. And so, so she's here in a part of the world that she's completely unfamiliar with feeling like, what do I do now? Have I made a mistake? Why am I here? What am I doing? And she's just kind of going through a lot. And so Whitney hears this and she says, hey, well, rather than just saying, man, let me pray for you, you know, have a great night. I hope to see you tomorrow night. She's like, no, 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 no. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep pushing this thing. I'm going to go further. So she invites her to go to the next move. You know what the next move is? It's something that we do where we get people engaged in our church. It's one of the four things that we do here. Baptism, next move, small groups, and volunteering, right? It's one of those main four things that we do as a church. Well, Whitney does what she's supposed to do. She invites her to come to the next move with her. And then she goes a step further, though. She says, hey, would you like to just come to my small group? We have, I have a small group that's going to be meeting soon. And would you like to come and just join our group? And so this young girl gets involved in Whitney's small group, goes through the next move, 
And now she's serving out at our South Campus in our kids' ministry. How cool is that? How cool is that? So cool. It's not hard. It's just being aware of people around you. One last story. Let me tell you about Kenneth. Kenneth works in our, our kids' ministry department. In fact, Kenneth is Jordan Weston's older brother. And Kenneth is uh, a sneakerhead. If you don't know what a sneakerhead is, sneakerheads are people who collect tennis shoes. They love and are passionate about tennis shoes. Yes, there is a whole huge community of people. Well, Kenneth is specific in that he collects Jordan tennis shoes, like signature shoes, you know, Jordan, Jordan signature shoes. And he's, I mean, he's a big Jordan nut. He loves these, these shoes, and so he's collected lots of them. He loves these shoes. It's a big deal to him. In fact, he's got this, this issue so bad that he belongs to a Facebook group of other guys who just get on Facebook and talk about these shoes. They're, they have a serious problem, and we're in prayer for Kenneth on a regular basis. <laughs> but, he ha- but he has this. And so, so, so recently he was just saying to himself, okay, God, how can you use me? Like, I'm just going to surrender everything to you. And he just felt like God was putting it on his heart, just say, okay, God, I'm giving you these shoes. Now, that sounds so stupid. But he's just saying, God, I'm just going to give you these shoes. And I don't even know what that would look like, but I just offer my Jordan collection to you. Well, he felt like, through that, that God gave him an idea. No angel, no light, no none of that. Just, just an idea popped into his head about, what if I just took one of the pairs of shoes and I just gave it to one of the guys in my group? And so Kenneth did. He took his shoes, he took a pair of shoes, he said, hey, I want to give these to you. Reached out to one of the guys in his, in his Facebook group, said, I'd like to give these shoes to you. The guy was blown away. He said, just one catch. You just got to come to church with me. The guy doesn't go to church, and so he was like, well, you know, I don't normally go to church, but for Jordan's, I'll go to church. <laughs> That's how bad it was, right? So, so he comes to church, he's sitting in the auditorium, and Kenneth was there with him, and he just said, he was nervous, it's uncomfortable. I mean, people who don't come to church, it's not a comfortable experience for them, and so they're, they're coming, and some of you, I mean, you may be here this morning, and this may be kind of one of your first times in church in a long time, so you can relate, you know how he was feeling. He's just, you know, I don't, I don't go here very often, this is not my thing, and so, but he came, and he went, and he, he did the whole thing, and then after it was over, they went to go pick up uh, his kids. He had four kids that he brought with him. And so they go pick up his kids. And as they go to pick up his kids, Kenneth notices that his kids have stickers on, that, stickers that say, I am a child of God. Now, that may not mean much to you, but Kenneth works in our kids' department. And Kenneth knows this, that that sticker, when a kid has that sticker on, it means that that kid prayed to receive Christ as their Savior that day. And that guy's kids... <laughs> Receive Christ when they came here. It's amazing. After the fact, Kenneth asked him, he said, hey, uh, would you be willing to come back? And the guy was like, yeah, I think I will. He said, my kids, and I love this, he said, my kids had the time of their lives at church. It's phenomenal. But it's a simple thing. Just, God, what can I do personally to impact somebody's life? life this week? What if you changed the posture of the way you live? What if instead of just primarily focusing on what you've got to get done, you started thinking about other people? You just said, I I still got to get everything done, but while I'm getting everything done, I'm just going to be aware. I'm just going to say, God, I'm available. Hands up, palms up. I'm available. God, I'm available. What if you started coming to church in a different way? What if rather than sitting in these seats strictly just to receive, you said, okay, God, no longer am I just going to be here to receive, although I am going to receive. I'm going to put Jesus' word to the test when he said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Some of you have never put that into practice at church. Oh, you think it only applies to giving. Oh, it applies to so much more than that. What if you applied that to your church experience when you came and you just said, okay, who could I bless this week? Who could I, who could, like, you're just looking around. Who could I impact this week? Who could I be aware of? Because there are people right here in this room and in our South Campus who are hurting and need Jesus. What would it look like? What would happen if you personally started making an impact in people's lives this week. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this question. This question that doesn't allow us to stay as we were, but it forces us to look beyond ourselves at other people, people that you cared about so much. You became flesh and blood, and you endured a horrible death on the cross for us, for people that you care about 
so much. Lord, the people that we find unlovely, the people that we want to push away, those are people that you died for. Lord, help us to see them like you see them. And Lord, today we just put our palms up and we say, we surrender to you. Lord, all of my gifts, all of my talents, any influence that I have, any position that I have, I give it to you. Use it to expand your kingdom. Lord, we want our kingdom or your kingdom to expand and we want to be a part of it. Thank you that you're going to partner through us. Let us be those kinds of people. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Hey, whether you're here in this room, maybe you're watching online or maybe you're out at our South Campus, but you have never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Maybe you prayed a prayer, maybe you had a religious experience at one point, but you'd say, you know what, I'm not living for Christ right now. It's not changing me. There's nothing different about me, and today you want to change that. Today you say, I want to pray to receive Christ. If that's you, here's what we're going to do. We're all going to pray, and I'm going to ask everybody, no matter where you're watching from, to join in. We're going to pray this together. This is just called our Believer's Prayer. And what happens is this. If you pray this prayer and you mean it in your heart, here's what Jesus will do. He will come into your life, into your heart, and begin to change you from the inside out. So let's pray this prayer together. Everybody join with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place, to pay for my sins. But I believe that he did not stay dead, but that you raised him from the grave. And when you raised him up, you raised me up with him. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I commit my life to you. I will follow you from this day forward. I am your disciple. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, hey, let's make some noise for everybody who just prayed that prayer. Hey. If that's you, you just prayed that prayer, or maybe you prayed over the last few weeks, but you've not been baptized. Or maybe you were baptized years ago, but you're starting over again in your walk with God, and you'd like to, you'd like to just kind of uh, drive a stake in the ground and say, today's my day. We've got a room over here. It's called our baptism room. We baptize people in there every single weekend. We baptize people in there every weekend who weren't even prepared to be baptized, but we brought shirts and shorts and towels and everything you need to get baptized over here and then move on with the rest of your day. Jesus said this, he said, if you're going to follow me, I want you to be baptized. And it's a symbol of the old you going underneath the water and a new you coming back to life in its place. And uh, we, we, we love to share this experience with, with people from our, our church community every single weekend. So if that's you, grab somebody from your section and say, hey, I'm going to be baptized. Go in there. We would love to celebrate that with you. We've got pastors in there, friends with you. We would love to celebrate baptism with you. Hey, we're going to continue this series for the next couple of weeks. We're going to keep drilling down on this question because it's a deep question that goes even further than what we talked about today. So don't miss next week as we talk about this question a little bit further. Stand to your feet. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week. You're dismissed.